All right, y'all. Hello. Welcome to another episode of the XL Tribesman Podcast. So we kicked off the year with my good friend Jelani and I when he was here in Atlanta. And we I was really testing my new setup because at that time I was just setting up my studio. And then here we are now with our next episode of the year, Adam. And we're going to get into some topics that I really... I really want to dive into more relationship things this year because I feel like there's the space for that, um, specifically for bigger men. And I really want to, you know, like, that's where the focus of the podcast is going to be. We talk about relationship on here. Obviously, this is a fashion brand. We're never going to leave out the fashion. Um, But today I have special guest Adam on and... I want Adam to introduce himself to the people because a lot of people know Adam, but I don't know if a lot of people have ever heard Adam. So tell the people. What up, though? Adam here. Uh, born and raised in D.C., uh, Northeast D.C. to be exact. I'm a singer, songwriter, producer, aspiring model, um, a nigga who love community, you know, um, yeah, I'm just here to, you know, chop it up with my fellow big boy, you know, see. What- Ain't nothing wrong with that. Ain't nothing wrong with that. <laughs> okay. So, Adam, a lot of people know you, you know, from being in the big and tall community. Um, you have a very strong presence on Twitter. Um, and I want to know, how did you, how were you able to garner the attention of so many eyes? What was what was the thing you did, if you remember or you recall, like the thing you did that people was just like, follow, 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 follow. Like, what was the thing, if you remember? Mm, you know, uh, so to answer that question, let me ask for a little bit of clarity. Are you referring to Twitter in general or just social media? You know what? I'm going to broaden that, social media. All right, so... um. I can actually do a two part. I can answer that, that piece too. So starting with social media, uh, I don't know if you remember Tumblr, but, uh, I was, yes, I, I was a Tumblr kid, you know? Um, I have, to, so which side of Tumblr were you on? Gotcha. So, so I, I ran a Tumblr blog back in the day, like when I, when I was eight, like 17, I started it. Um, I ain't really grow up with a lot of, a lot of friends didn't really have a lot of like social experience like I wanted to. So I just started journaling. Um, I was doing like journal posts. I post poetry, you know, shit like that. I mean, ooh, can I, can okay. Can oh. I say shit? Is that cool? Yeah. Right, cool, cause, uh, you were cussing this motherfucker? I, I cussed every five motherfucking words. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's what I did. Um, that was my way to express myself and to try to like reach out to other people. And my Tumblr blog ended up gaining some traction. And then okay. I started like posting pictures of myself, um, you know, like of my face and like posting videos of me, like doing various things, whether it be like singing or writing or whatever the case may be. Um, so my Tumblr kind of kicked off. I, it wasn't big. It wasn't huge, but I did gain a following from that. And then when, mm-hmm. when Tumblr started to get, a little old, and when people started migrating away from Tumblr, is when I started migrating towards IG. Um, because I had an IG, I wasn't really okay. Sure about it. Um, oh, so you, so you, so you went from Tumblr to IG. You never did the. Oh no, Vine was after. Go ahead, Vine was never after. Did Vine. I was like, yeah, Vine was after. Um, yeah. So Vine passed me too. During this transition point was when I started to be more comfortable with my body. Um, I've always had a ah. weird relationship with my body, mainly because I deal with body dysmorphia. And one of the things that I told myself around that time was like, nigga, you gotta find a way to be comfortable in your body, even while navigating this very weird space of body dysmorphia. Right. Um, so I just started mm-hmm. documenting my journey. I started documenting my journey. I started being really honest and candid and forthcoming about what I deal with and people took to it. Um, they took to it for different reasons, 
And, you know, I was acutely aware that, like, okay, most people are going to look at this and they're going to see a thing to consume, but then there are going to be some people who are going to be receptive to the message. Um, okay. And I, All right. So you were very, very cognizant of that from day one. Yeah, because I, I know people. I get people. Oh, okay. Um, so for me, it was more so do I tailor my life and how I move through the world based on people's preconceived notions? Or do I choose to stand in the totality of who I am and be honest about my things and my journey in the hopes of being able to relate to or help someone else in the process, regardless of what those people, mm -hmm. and I chose the latter. So, um, and you know, that, that did wonders for me. Cause, uh, <laughs> I ended up with my first IG account, I ended up with like 13 K followers in around a year, which really threw me off. Cause I'm like, all Wait, you said first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this IG account that I have now is like my third. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. A lot, uh -huh. a lot of people don't know that. Usually the only people who know that are people who've been following me since like the first IG or like the Tumblr days. But but some, some, of, my, some of my niggas who I, who I really fuck with, like they, they know. They know what's up and what's up. But, um, oh, okay. But basically, long story short, um, Cause it's a story. Yeah. Long story short, um, I had posted a post about my body dysmorphia, and um, I was in my underwear, and that was probably the biggest post that I made at that time. Um, I don't remember mm -hmm. what the exact likes was, cause I believe it or not, I don't really pay attention to that. Um, but I just remember it was the biggest post, and it had the most engagement I had, and. IG was not nearly as, um, IG was not nearly as transparent with its metrics like it is now, back then. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah. But I just, I just noticed a spike in activity and engagement. Um, but mm -hmm. the happening subsequently was that people were engaged with me like a thing to be consumed and not a person. And I didn't like that. I didn't like the energy. So I deleted it and I did that again. Oh, <laughs> so I did that twice, but with this iteration of my IG, um, come on iteration. I wanted to, I wanted to kind of gear up towards like all the things that I've been working towards in silence, all the moves I've been making in silence. And okay. So I was like, you know what? I'm in a space where I can more comfortably I can more comfortably accept the fact that this is just probably going to be a consistent thing with me being a, a black queer man housed in a fat body. And I use air quotes cause, um, in some sectors I'm considered fat and in other sectors I'm not because of my body type, I do have certain privileges. So I want to make sure that like I speak to that. Um, but, um, because the way that people see that's a fact. The way that people see me as fat and the way that people see niggas heavier than me as fat are different because my body is more socially acceptable. So like I would be doing all of us a disservice in our community for me to not one acknowledge that privilege and then to two speak on it and then the three to leverage it, which is what I do. Um but yeah, like so this this particular IG for me um, is about it's about kind of like putting my best foot forward and doing more to leverage that while also pushing forward towards all the things I want for myself, like as far as music, as far as modeling, you know, as far as fashion, you know, you name it. So, uh, okay, no question. <laughs> that makes that makes a lot of sense in how in how you move on the internet because you have that. You know, you have that cognizant um, that you are ready to take on, you know, a lot of your goals, which it is, like you said, to be a singer, an actor, a model. Um, so what I would like to know from from the deletion of those first two Instagrams, this third one, how do you feel that you show up differently? Because honestly, no one no one on the internet has changed. They're still looking at your pictures to as something to be consumed. So how have you changed to view that differently? Cause I'm sure, I'm sure 
them DMs look like a meat market. I'm I'm really sure. Listen that. to me. Uh it is worse now. It's even worse now. Uh people are way more brazen and uncouth than they've ever been. The thing is is that My God. Those are those are those are those are two dollar words, sir. Those are a little expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Go ahead, though. I got you. I'm a, I'm, they are very profile. I love to learn. I love words. I love to express myself through words. My favorite words are uh, fuck and nigga. Nigga being my favorite word ever. But yeah, I love words. <laughs> so I feel you. So uh, <laughs> it's funny because not much about me has changed in that aspect. Many things have changed in the aspect, mm-hmm. aspect of who I am as a being. But in in how I navigate social media, not much has changed. The only thing that's changed is that I just got better boundaries. That's all. I just got better boundaries. Okay. Well, that's that's important. And IG got better boundaries because now, like most niggas, got a request. You got a button you can click and make it disappear. Quest to message me now. I can screen messages now, and when I block someone, I can also block any other account they would create afterwards. So, like, in my block game. My block game strong, like <laughs> I mean, like Mike Tice strong. You have to block people that often. I get about, I get about like I would say on average, I get around like twenty DMs a week, and uh, most of those DMs. I'm I'm not doing something right, but okay. Most of the DMs, are, no, I need to be if I, if you're not doing something right, then I need to be doing something wrong because like I'm not. That ain't my sneeze, but, um, you know, I, 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 I get it. I understand. Niggas want to shoot their shot. People have preconceived notions of you because that's, like, what society, society indoctrinates of us. Uh, to have preconceived we all do it. Um, mm-hmm. So it's less that it's more so the way that people come at me that I don't like. But Okay, okay. I can see that. Yep, because I'm sure there's a lot of disrespect. It, it's, 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 it's very carnal it's very uh hypersexual and objectifying but i'm also a big dark-skinned black man so people not normally going to engage with me as a human being anyway and i knew th- i learned that oh that before I even began. wait hold on wait hold on wait you touched on something all right enlighten me enlighten enlighten the audience so do you feel like being a darker skinned black person, pe- man, big man at that, people engage with you non human like? Yeah, because so we live in a society that is predicated on like forms of bigotry such as like racism and sexism, right? And uh-huh. to how deep um, homophobia, queer phobia, however you want to frame that, when we get to how deep that runs. And how it's looked at as a form of emasculation, even though emasculation don't exist, you're considered less of a man. And when it comes to people who are housed in bodies that have been socialized as male, the darker your tone, the less of a man, the less of a man in terms of ma- like mankind, of humanity, the less of a man that you're considered. So when you're oh. and queer or black and of the LGBTQ plus community, like, Nigga, that's a that's a double negative. I get it. And okay. then I get it. So community, we, like even in our own community, we tend to perpetuate these hierarchies in order to make our ourselves feel better. So for me, I would say a good eighty percent of the time that I'm engaging with other queer people, even they're not meeting me at my humanity. They're not engaged with me like a human. They're not engaged with me as a, a person. They're engaging with me as the stereotypical black mandingo archetype, or they're engaged with me as the typical DL nigga archetype, or they're engaged with me as insert negative, short-sighted black man archetype here. Very rarely am I engaged with like a actual nigga. <laughs> okay, so hold on. Okay, all right, okay. All right, so this this leads me this leads me down a, a thought process, yeah. right? So, in retrospect, thinking about that, right? So that means that 
that means I'm I'm thinking about it because I'm thinking about all the times I've shot my shot at people now with with this thought process in mind, right? And so that means that anything that's overtly well, you said insert. Okay, I get it. I get it. Now that I'm like giving a bit more thought, okay, I get it. I, I just I guess because I'm what I'm trying to imagine is like how does that show up, right? Like, how does that look? But I get it now that you said, like, well, actually, here. here and I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, I get it. So, basically, people DM you, like, blow my back out. No, shit like but- that, right? That would be, like, insert here because they look at you and they think Mandingo Warrior. Got it. Okay. See, that's what I was trying to uh, visualize. Like, what does that show up like? All right cool because i'm like someone's shooting their shot at you like how do you determine like but i guess it is different from saying hey like how are you doing today i thought you looked really nice versus like i'm cool with that yeah that's very different but that's just because like i'm not the type of nigga who normally like contrary to popular belief just because someone is comfortable with their body or just because someone is willing to show their body does not mean that they are sexual because the body is not an inherently sexual thing. Um, I'm, and most people who know me know that I'm not really that sexual of a being to begin with. Um, so when people engage with me in a sexually tinged way or the discourse that we engage in or that they initiate is sexual, that's already kind of a turnoff for me. Cause I'm like, okay, so this is, this is how you engage with me because you see me in this light. And it's like, I'm more than that. And you may not have the capacity to see that, but I also don't got to engage with that. But if somebody come in, oh, I saw you, you know, I think you attractive, man. I just got to tell you, you attractive, whatever the case may be. Like, I'm cool with that. I ain't got no qualms with it. It's when niggas hit me up and be like, oh, um, you know, I just want you to, like you said, I just want you to blow my back out. Or, or matter of fact, just the other day, I, <laughs> I was looking for a message. One of my friends sent me in my DMs, right? Because I don't normally check them for these reasons. But I went in there and somebody was like, Hey, how do you feel about race play? I, I just I want you to be my Mandingo slave. And then another message that somebody sent me like a couple weeks earlier, somebody was like, "Damn!" Somebody was like, "Damn, Papa! I just know that dick big. I just want you to choke me with that shit." Mind you, know how? Know how you doing? Know how your day been? Like, but, but wow, major, that's majority of what I get. I was even I was more shocked than I thought I would be. I mean, I knew people were bold. I just oh, no, it gets worse. I'm in, I'm being PG about the situation. It gets worse. <laughs> it gets... That's PG because most of the time people don't even send me messages. They just send me their their holes and their dicks and them getting fucked. Or they... oh, okay, all right, all right, all right. Wow, all right. Well, again, wow. Remember, all right. Well, I'm then not just so for real. I'm not even a sexual nigga for real. So imagine how jarring that is for me to open my DMs and I see a video, I see a message that says play video and then I open it. And then that's what I, that's- and I so, hate that Instagram does that. Can you show me a preview? So I know if I need to play or so not. Now what I do when I see them, I don't eat, I don't even watch them. I've been doing this for like the past two years. I don't even watch them. I just delete it and I leave it alone. If they message me again, I just block them. And there's many people who was like, yo, I sent you this dope thing and I wanted you to check it out. You never saw it. That's why. <laughs> so you heard it here today. That's why I didn't see it because I have been deeply traumatized by gaping holes and unsolicited nudes that I did not ask for. That nigga send me all day. <laughs> Please send it to my email. It is in my bio. <laughs> don't don't send me no nudes in my in my bio because then I'm gonna have to. That's what I was like. Wait. <laughs> so just like like if if there's anything important that you want to send me or that you want me to be a part of. It's probably better for you to go through the necessary proper channels to provide me that because I ain't gonna look on IG for it or Twitter for that matter. Matter of fact, on Twitter, I don't even got my uh, my uh, direct messages open. You can't even message me. So, wow, that's a that's a lot. I want to unpack that. Not right now, but I want to unpack that because like, I I guess I never. I guess, like I said, you know, every experience in life, you you learn to navigate it differently. 
I just couldn't imagine like that don't happen to me, so I, it's hard to imagine. But I think, like you said, what you learned was how to set boundaries, which is very important in general in life to have boundaries so that you prevent yourself from having any sort of trauma, you know? So I really love that you've learned, although in a, in a way, right? In a way, uh, I don't know how, like, like on the other end of, on the non-sexual end of DMs, right? I've also gotten a, 90% of my business comes from DMs. Yeah. So like, I also don't want you to miss out on that 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 singing gig. I don't want you to miss out on a legit agency reaching out to you. Well, you your emails in your bio, so they'll probably email you, but like I don't want you to miss out on an opportunity that could come from a DM. Yeah, but anything that's actually truly meant for me, I ain't gonna miss it. You know what? And then there's that. And then, you know what? Uh, spoken very honestly. That's a fact. So in that note, that is very true. So what I want to get to is, so I'm very big on learning the story behind things, gotcha. right? And so what I did earlier was I went to check out your Instagram and I thought I would love to know the story behind it. Because as a photographer myself, every photo has a story, whether that be, it took me 30,000 times to get this right pose or how I had to go on YouTube university right quick to learn how to like compose this photo this way, whatever it is, there's a story behind it. Right. And I feel like there's a famous photo of you. Uh, um, I'm a bit far from the, but I don't know. Can you see oh, that photo? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me the story behind that photo. I, did, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. You knew I was going to pick that I did, one? I did. I did. Cause it's 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 famous on the internet. It gets it gets it gets it gets it, it get around. It gets around. Like Tupac said. What you mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I post it on my, like it's everywhere. I post it on my Twitter, but like that's all I that's all I've seen of it. I, I mean, it's on my Twitter. Um. Yeah, but you see it on Twitter. You see it like other people share it. You, I I've seen it in some of those groups. So yeah, tell me, don't be looking surprised. <laughs> Not like I really, I don't know if niggas know this about me or understand this. I post my, I post it in my mm. slide. Like, oh, you don't engage. You just post I'm not go. deeply invested in social media. Like, I'm, good, but Got I'm it. not invested in it. Like, I'm trying to be invested in it mm -hmm. now because now my career is starting to ramp up. But like, I love people. I don't love social media. Interesting. So I post my shit and I slide and I usually come back after some time so that I can make sure that I'm connecting with the people who show me love. I mean, as you see, I try okay. my best to respond to people when they, you know, when they reach out to me. Um, but other than that, no, I don't, I'm not like I'm not on social media looking for like who reposted me and like all that. No, I don't. I post my shit and I go back to my life. That makes sense. I think for me. It's a little different, so that's probably why I noticed. Cause I'm, I'm always looking for the next. On Instagram, I'm always looking to see what's hot, what's popping, who's next up to bat. Because I want to have my finger on the pulse at all times, and I feel like a lot of times, most of um, most of the people that I decide to interview on this podcast. I find them because they got popping on social yeah. somewhere. And I'm just like, the world needs to hear from you. Especially when I see people that I engage with, but you never hear from them. You just see them. So you don't know anything about them, really. You just see whatever 15 second video they put up or whatever still photo they put up. Other than that, you don't know nothing about them. You don't know what they into. You don't have the time. You don't even know what the people sound like. That part. <laughs> so... Right, so I think that's kind of where my my thing is for social, but um, I totally get it. It's important, especially like you said, setting boundaries. And if if for you the boundary is I'm a post and slide, then 
I get that. That makes perfect sense because you got to do what's best. For oh, I'm gonna do that. Whatever. Oh, oh, but I, I, I'm gonna do that anyway because that's how I am. I don't know. If, I don't know. If you I know, love it. It's hilarious. <laughs> no, huh? I, I was I was quoting a, a like a um a little uh video that kind of went. I'm gonna do that shit regardless. Yeah, no, nah, she she was like. I feel like I know that meme. I feel like I know I that meme. <laughs> My best friend, she always that makes she sense. always quoted. So now I be quoting it. <laughs> now you quoting it? Okay, makes sense. Um. So yeah, tell us about that photo. What's the story behind the photo? The story behind the photo involves a person that you and I both love and care for dearly. Um, our homie yes. Jelani. Um, so. Oh, he took no, he didn't take, I took it. What happened was, uh, okay, he 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 had a he had a gig or whatever, and um, I was waiting for him to come back because he said he was like in a lot of pain. Um, so I was going to like make sure that he was alright or whatever. So I was bored. I had just finished the workout, and um, around this time I was just starting to get into the idea of modeling. So I decided to like play around with some test shoots. I was playing the game. I was okay. playing the game, got bored of playing the game. I'd be playing my Switch sometimes. Um, that was the controller that okay. was by me. Um, yeah, that really was that really wasn't a setup. I just I I really was in the middle of doing a thing, and then I came up with what I did. Um, and for real, for real, I I really don't wear clothes. Quiet is kept. I had to put on shorts to do that. I did not have on shorts. <laughs> so. Um, Cause when I'm in the when I'm in the comfort of my own space, I'm not wearing clothes. Uh, but I wanted to test some ideas out, see what kind of lighting works for me, shit like that. Um, cause when I'm trying to get into something, I really try to learn the ins and outs of it. And so I took along with, okay. I believe two, two or three other photos. Um, you may have seen those two. One was me standing up, and one was just a like a face photo. I was just playing around with like lighting and like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and I just posted them to see like how people would respond to them. And we here. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. Back up. So you took three photos? I'm just think- not three. <laughs> you took three photos? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it was three. I think it was three. Um, there's a Twitter post that I posted of all the pictures together. I think it was it was three or four. I can't remember for real. Um, but of those, that's all you took to get that? No, like, it was that photo, a different photo, and a different photo from those photos. I only... No, I get that. Yeah. So yeah. you're basically saying you took three photos, and this is one of the three yes. photos. Yes. See... See, modeling was made for you. I just want to let you know. You, 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 you. Some of us have to take a hundred photos to. No, sometimes I do too. Sometimes I, most times. Oh, you just, oh, you just, oh, you just hit a lick that day. I feel like what it was with the lighting was good for me, and I was in a comfortable space because most times for me, I got to take a shit ton of photos because the lighting ain't good. Like even when it comes to like camera phones. Though the, the lighting isn't usually tailored for darker skinned individuals, and uh, and like yes, that the, is correct. I the quality of that. filters, et cetera, so on and so forth, that don't necessarily accommodate a nigga of my skin tone, because not only am I dark skinned, but I have red undertones, um, and like you know I'm tall too, so that plays a factor into how lighting falls on me as well. Uh, yes, very and much. Bigger true. body, so that plays a factor into that as well. Like, um, yeah, so I, shadows, depth to feel all that. It didn't take me many times to get those photos right. It wasn't like I took one photo when it just came out that way, but it was definitely less than five. But I was just, that was just, I guess it was just circumstance because that's not normally what they ain't normally what I, okay. that's not how it always goes. Okay, because yeah. yeah, it, it, uh, when I, when I create selfies, I. <sighs> I don't even like selfies. I'm a fucking photographer. It just takes me like I can take other people's selfies really quickly, but myself, it's like I'm here. I'm like, mm, I don't like that. 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 Mm, I don't, man, fuck this shit. That's how I usually go for me. 
And then I just be like, fuck it. Cause I don't know. So it's, it's, it's great to know that you, you were just feeling like, fuck it. I'm gonna take some photos today. And that's what they came out. Cause I feel like a lot of times that is where my best photos come out from too. It's like, I got five minutes, like fucking hurry up. Click, click. All right, cool. Got it. Gone. Like those be the best photos. The ones where I'm sitting there and I have like ample amount of time. I may, maybe it's, maybe it is like a mental thing that like, maybe cause you have so much time. Yeah. You, you can mull over the details a bit more. So you're like, I don't like the way my lip looks. I don't like the way my eyebrows froing right there. Like all the different things where when you got five minutes, like, is it good? Am I clear? All right. I got a theory. So that's good. I got a theory on that. I feel like sometimes, I feel like most times the reason why those come out better is because when you feel like you're in a time crunch, you ain't got enough time to really consider all the things that you would normally pick apart all the ways in which you would normally be um, hyper aware or hyper diligent about or any of the ways that you would normally be uh, insecure or question, you know, most times when people take photos of us or take videos of us, they can see us in the light that we can't see ourselves because they don't have the eternal shit that we got to deal with. And every time that you put yourself in front of a mirror, or in front of a camera, you're consistently reckoning with those things. But if you ain't got the time to reckon with it, it ain't it ain't in the way. Um, it's just a theory, but yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm I'm gonna say I like the theory. It sounds good to me because that sounds a lot like what it is. I don't know. I I like full body photos. I just it's selfies that I don't. I'm not like. a big fan of selfies either. I wanted to touch on it too, um, real quick. Just a quick aside. Mm-hmm. I wanted to touch on something you said earlier about uh, about like opportunities and um, as far as like my photos and like how modeling it was for me. Um, I love that you feel that way, and I'm very grateful for that. I'm very grateful that you gave me that and I received that. Uh, I want to use that as an opportunity to tell anybody who's watching, like, don't ever be so afraid that you don't put yourself out there because you never know what you can gain from it. Those pic, that picture you just showed mm-hmm. niggas don't know this, but like I've gotten so many opportunities just off that photo, <laughs> just off the opportunities that I didn't even think that I had the caliber to like receive what I'm saying. And I didn't even know that. I mean, you and I, we did have a conversation about, about a thing. We did, but I didn't know that photo was the right, photo. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's the thing, like, most people would look at me and say, oh, well, like, you can't do this, or you ain't got the capacity for this because, oh, you just a nigga who posts pics on IG, but, like, or you just a nigga who posts pics on Twitter, or whatever the case may be. But the the only right way to get to where you want to go is the way that works for you. And can't, can't nobody else make a call on that and all i'm gonna say is you know as long as you ain't harming nobody as long as you respecting yourself and you setting boundaries and you respecting other people's boundaries do you whatever that whatever that look like it's so funny it's working for me (laughs) i'm so it's so interesting you say that do you know that that uh i'm gonna call it model that you just set that motto is is um is my church's motto. We have one motto or one rule. We call it one rule. And that's it. Like love yourself like you love your neighbor, like you love God. That's it. As long as you're not harming yourself or harming anyone else, do you. And I and you don't even know my church and you know that. Like, I find that, I find through, when I talk to people, like, alignment is everywhere. You just have to, you just have to be present and it will show that up, part. right? See, I just, I just knew this interview was going to be, it was going to be what it was going to be. Okay. All right. 
So what I want to know is, so now we're getting to the portion of my podcast where I, I ask some questions. Um, some of them are going to be long form. Some are going to be rapid. What is- rapid. So we're going to do the rapid ones first. So this is the yeah. this or that. So Miami or Vegas? Miami. Gotta be. <laughs> Vegas. I love Nick. Walmart or Target? No, I said I love huh? nature and hate capitalism. So Miami. <laughs> oh, but uh, okay. Vegas is more than the strip, though. You know I that, do. right? I do. How? If you if you love nature, then Henderson County's for you. However, there are more opportunities for me to engage with different forms of nature in Miami than in Vegas. Okay, you got the water. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> <laughs> Not too much on Miami, Slim. Not too it. much on Miami. <laughs> No, I love Miami. I prefer it over Vegas any day. I'm just, I'm just wondering. Um, Walmart or Target? Tar-J. Tar-J all day. Tar-J all day. All day. All day. Listen. All day. All day. Although. Listen. Right. See, Wally World got the $5 clothes. Target That's got that. Like for me, everything I ever want or need is in Target. And every time I go to Walmart for specific things, I'm all, it's always something that I cannot find or is out of stock. So it's based on just like personal experience. And also when I was in LA, um, I literally lived like up the block from a target. And when I tell you that target came in clutch, oof, man, <laughs> clutch. Okay. I mean, I like target too. I just, you know, when I walk into target, I got me and my wallet. Got to have a conversation. We only spending $10 in this bitch. No, okay? I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah, because Target ain't like Walmart. Like, $100 at Walmart and $100 at Target. Yeah, it hit different. Totally it hit different. different. Yeah, it's going to be one bag at Target. It's going to be at least three at Walmart. I'm just saying. Like, <laughs> See? Okay. Okay, Gap or Arrow Pasta? Of course, Gap. I don't even got to think about that. Actually, no, neither. Because <laughs> that whole Gap situation that happened in, uh, I think, 2020 uh, with the black boy, I didn't forget that. Uh, and Arrow Pasta. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. And then Arrow Pasta. Oh. The- Arrow Pasta is what happens when you take like normal like casual streetwear beachwear and then you take all of the life out of it Aeropostale that's an interesting way to put it Aeropostale just is like to me it just does not feel um It doesn't speak to it you. It don't. It don't. I was I was gonna go somewhere else with that, but it don't. <laughs> yeah, no, it don't speak to you. I get it. It's it to me. It's a very teenage brand, um, but I think in the essence of that, you know, Arrow is also like Walmart, right? Yeah. It's very cheap. Gap is like Target. It's very expensive. So, Ironically. you know, that's that's kind of where I was going with the reference. Of gap versus because they're one is double, triple the price yeah. of the other. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so what I want to know is what are some of your favorite places to shop? Uh, online in the comfort of my home with no clothes on. <laughs> of course, you are. <laughs> Okay, that's how you shop. So when you're in your home with no clothes, with the phone or computer or tablet, what websites are you going to to order? Hundred Braun. Oh, uh, come on, Hundred Braun. So, uh, I used to be really big on ASOS. Used to be really big on ASOS. Oh, I love me some ASOS, but oh, you know you what? Know. 
the big and tall sex. You say you used to be. What, what happened? happened is, um, I just, I don't know. I, I just don't, I just don't shop there as much. I don't think anything particularly happened though. Uh, oh, okay. I'm you just, really, you moved on I'm to really, something else. I'm a really big thrifter. I'm really big on like thrift shops, consignment shops, shit like that. Uh, whoa. Whoa, I have so many questions. So if big and tall men have been ostracized in fashion for so long, how do you find things at thrift stores? Because fashion is cyclical. And you can make so many things fashion, even things that aren't considered fashionable. Because at the end of the day, there's got to be clothes for big and tall people because everybody got to wear clothes. So you go and find something, you just got to head eye and you got to know what works for you. They can see me put, okay. put my shit together. Fair enough. They be like, oh, where you get that or where you get that or I didn't, I don't see how you could have made that a thing, but that looks dope. And it's like, yeah, because I know what worked for me and I got an eye. I know how to work with color palettes. I know how to use contrast to my advantage. I know how to coordinate to my advantage. I know how to use, make wets and shit like that. Come so on. it's all about just. Come on, color palettes. What y'all know about a color palette? Yo, listen, if this interview don't elevate y'all vocabulary, I don't know what y'all <laughs> doing. Because <laughs> when I tell you Adam is out here dropping all of the $2 words come on, on. y'all. <laughs> come on, Alex. Don't flatter me like that, Slim. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... <laughs> okay. So... um. So now let's switch gears a little bit. So I want to know a little bit about what it was like for Adam growing up as a darker skin, bigger child. What was that like? Or were you a bigger child, actually? I actually have no clue. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I, for starters, no, I was not. Um, I was definitely small and thin. Uh I didn't actually grow into the body that you see now or the like the form that you see now until I was like almost like 21. I started really gaining height around 18. Um my, my mom oh, was, um she was she was 5'11, uh rest in peace. Um and my my pops um was six, six, four, six, five. Um, and I have an older brother who's six, eight. So, uh, you were definitely yeah, tall. Cause for those who don't know, I'm six, three, but, um, I didn't even hit. No, I didn't, I didn't even hit that. six feet till I was like 20, 21. I was a very late bloomer. And me personally, I feel like a part of it is because I was born like extremely premature because that's the only sense I can make for why it took me so long to, to get there. Uh, but, um, but yeah, your body is still growing until 25. So you got from zero to 25 to figure out how tall, but I didn't hit six, three until I was closer to 26. I was like, wait, you kept growing six, after one 21 for, for a minute. I was, cause my, um, one of my former former girlfriends, uh, she's six, she's six two, closer to six three, but she's like six two and some change, and she's always been taller than me. Now we the same height. So yeah, um, yeah. I... But to answer, but to answer, so no, that's interesting. So that's an interesting yeah. challenge, right? To grow up being shorter, well, not shorter, but not as tall as you ended up being and then being thinner. What was that like growing um, up? So I didn't really deal with, I didn't deal with many issues in relation to my body from the outside world. Um, most of my body issues oh. were internal. Um, okay. And I, I, I deeply feel like a part of it is spiritual. I've always felt um, okay. in the world, but not of it. And I've had a lot of experiences in my life where I felt disconnected from my body. Um, 
also I come from a blackity black ass family and like um <laughs> what's funny is even though I was thin, I always had a big butt even as a kid. So like that was the one thing that niggas used to always like join me about or like kinda like point out is that I had a big butt. Oh uh, <laughs> later on I discovered why. That's a whole different conversation. <laughs> but uh but yeah, uh it's given it's given after <laughs> dark on that one, but continue. But as a kid, like, yeah, I had a lot of internal issues around my body because of body I developed at a very mm-hmm. early age. Um, but the outside world didn't really I didn't really have to deal with that from other people too much because I was thin. So I benefited from the privilege of being thin. Um in fact, I found Fair myself enough. having to often soothe and stand in solidarity with and sometimes defend my friends who were bigger than me because i was like clearly noticing how i was being treated differently because i was housed in a body that was different than this uh so that's always been a driving force behind how i moved through the world but um yeah growing up was rough but it wasn't for like any physical reasons it was more so like socio-economic shit Fair enough. I get that. Um, you know, one of the things I find to be interesting about my life now, right, is that like childhood, childhood um, body issues is is an area that I want to study more because I don't have any experience in that. I grew up a regular, for all intents and purposes, regular height, regular weight kid. So I never got picked on or no one ever liked. I always got picked for the sports teams, although I didn't fucking want to play because I wanted to do other shit, but not that. Um, I wanted to learn how to play spades on the computer game. You remember, you remember, uh, you remember that green game solitaire. That's what I wanted to do with my free time. And everybody wanted to play kickball or soccer or some shit. Man, I fucking want to play that. But like, so I don't have any of those issues. And so I'm, I'm deeply like investing myself in trying to understand, like, what does it feel like to live in a body where you've always had an issue with your body? Like, and not like, not, not in the way you described, because that's, that's also something I'm trying to uh, also understand. Like, what does it feel like to grow up in a body where internally you don't like your body, but externally 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 you've never received any negative feedback on it right so i'm I'm also intrigued to learn that too and so i guess that's a lot of what i want to focus on this year is like understanding how those things and then how they transform when you become an adult how you see yourself how you move through the world because i see that's what i see a lot of times right with bigger guys right i see that I've noticed being a bigger guy and then having a brand about bigger guys. What I've noticed is I've noticed a lot of big guys, they have a hunch in their back. I've noticed that. And I've also noticed that that also comes with the fact that they're always doing this. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that. And so I want to start seeing how I can help people, you know, straighten their back up, look straight at you and not like hunch their back and like hunch over, you know, like where they're always looking at the ground. Those are things I'm trying to like understand how to psychologically work through those things. And so that's, that's, you know, that's where I'm trying to go this year with the brand, you know, like expanding it beyond the physical into the mental. Cause I feel like 99.9% of the things wrong with the world is how we think because that carries out into how we live, how we move, how we treat other people, how we treat ourselves. It's all about how we think, how we see ourselves and how we see other people. So um, I'm very intrigued to learn about um, body dysmorphia. What does that, if you could sum that up into a sentence, what does that Mm. feel like? 
I would love to do that. Before I do that, can um can I wrap back around to the to the previous question just so I can like add on a little bit? Yes. Um so mm-hmm. when you were saying that you wanted to learn more about like that type of upbringing and how those things affect people, for me personally, like while I didn't have I didn't have a lot of people or many people at all critiquing me or antagonizing me about my body. I had a lot of people critiquing me, critiquing and antagonizing me for who I was and how I showed up in the world. And so those things ultimately made me not feel good about any part of myself. So it's not all, there aren't all, oh. so people, people engage with you in a multitude of ways. And it's not always them engaging with you and your physicality that causes you to think negatively about your physicality. You know, Ah, okay. All right. Expansion. Um, behavior, and there's so much nuance to how we internalize things. It wasn't like people were going around telling me all the time, like, "Oh, you, you fat, or you, you gaining too much weight, or you eat too much this and the third. No, it was that, "Oh, you're too weird," or "Why you can't be like your brothers," or you know, um, I could, I could go into a lot of things, and I don't know if this is the right moment to do that. But um, I would just say that I didn't grow up in an environment where, one, there was space for me to be my own individual. Because I grew up in, I grew up in a family that was really out here in the field, if you know what I mean. Like, that's the type of family I grew up in. Um, and I was never aligned with that. Um, and so that already set me apart. And then I was always, I was always a precocious little nigga, like. I was already like, I was already like way past like elementary school, like comprehension and and expression before I even got to like second grade. I was, there were times where I was tutoring my brothers and their homework and their like grades ahead of me. You know, I learned sign language before I even started kindergarten. Like, so I was always a very precocious, very advanced child. And I always just wanted Experience, but I wasn't mm-hmm. in an environment that allowed me to do that safely and freely, nor did I grow up in a household that allowed me to do those things safely and freely. Um, that impacted how I gotcha. saw myself in all aspects of my life, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. And to go back to what you said about feeling like 99.9% of the issues with the world is about how we think, I actually, I understand why you would come to that. For me personally, I think it's more about how we feel or the lack thereof, because we live in a society that teaches us that feelings are not worth exploring and that feelings are a weakness. And because of that, we're always sacrificing and bartering our feelings in order for the more logical thing. Or uh, there are occasions where people choose to think as opposed to feel and choose to feel as opposed to think when those are both a yin and yang of a thing that's supposed to coexist. And I think that's the issue. We don't, we don't operate in our full selves enough and we don't allow others to operate in their full selves enough because we weren't given that opportunity and we didn't work through those things. So we don't want other people to be able to have that same freedom that we so long for. That's how I see it. Mm. Okay. I see what you did there. You took my thought and you expanded it. I I see that. I, I'll I'll add that to that the thinking and feeling because yeah. they go together they do um, they should at least um, okay so that makes perfect sense um, in a way that if you don't feel or think of yourself in the fullest way how do you allow how can you allow someone else the space to do the same thing which is probably where a lot of the issues that we deal with in the world come from that makes perfect so I- sense actually. Um, I said, ask me your question again. Go ahead. <laughs> Did you lose it? <laughs> I did. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. I d- oh, how did you deal with... Oh, I, if you can sum up, how did? how do you describe... Or how does it feel to have body dysmorphia in, in one sentence? sentence? That was my that was my question. Um, 
in one sentence. Let's see. Trying to cope with multiple body changes that you know didn't actually occur, even though it looks like they did. Whew. Well. Wow. Okay. I think I think that about sums yeah. it all the way yeah. up. This shit wild. This shit wild for real. Like <laughs> I can I can see you being a poet a, a poet. I, I can see I can see I can see it. I, used to I can, write poetry I, can hear it. I used to do that on my Tumblr a lot. I did it on IG too, but I stopped doing it once I realized that um niggas wasn't really like engaging with it and um I got really jaded about that cuz I was posting my poetry and people weren't engaging with it, but they were engaging with like you know my other pictures, but they weren't even engaging with that in a too understand me it was more so to consume me and so i just was i got jaded over it and i just never went i still write i write for my friends i write for the people i love and care for and i write for myself first and foremost but like i don't share it it's one of those things myself now fair enough well i do feel like it's important um what i feel and what i feel about learning about my time on being on social media it's important to have things that you share with the world, but it's also just as important to have things that you share just shit. for you. Shit. shit that keeps your cup filled, things that allow your cup to run it over so that you exactly. can share with the world. Exactly. So that's very important. I don't pour into like other that. people unless my glass is over pouring. I don't even pour when my glass is full. I'm not over pouring into someone else. When like my glass is half full, I'm not pouring into someone else. Only when my glass can overflow can I then provide for others. And so, uh, and a part of that is keeping things to myself. I got to keep some of that water retention to myself. I'm telling you, man. Literally. Boundaries is a beautiful thing. That's what helps you keep the cup filled. Yeah boundaries because people will use and abuse you and look you dead in your face when you thirsty looking for water they look you dead in your face and say this but i ain't asked you for that i actually i have a i have a, a analogy that i use in terms of like water reciprocity what's that and um getting needs and wants met because i believe that wants are just as important as needs um uh, i tell you all the time like when when you tell someone that you want water and they tell you that they cannot provide you the water it's usually easier for you to be like all right cool then i can't like i can't do this but for some odd reason we find it more difficult to set a boundary when we tell someone that we want water and they come back and they bring us juice and they come back and they bring us soda and they come back and they bring us a milkshake. And it's like, sometimes you can see, or oftentimes you can see that person going above and beyond and doing all they can to provide you that thing that's not water. And sometimes you'll tell them, I appreciate this, but I need water. You know, I appreciate this, but next time, can you bring me some water? I want some water. And they'll continually bring you the thing that's not water. And very rarely do I see people in, even in past versions of myself, have I actually set that boundary to say, there's a disconnect here because you keep bringing me back juice when I ask for water. Because that's hard. Yeah. It's hard. It, you don't want to have uncomfortable conversations because saying to someone, hey, there's a disconnect, causes tension well don't have can to. cause tension doesn't it don't have to but it can cause tension right it can cause discord and most people you know you know most people don't know how to handle the 
potential blowback of what that feels like to say, hey, I have an issue. You're not bringing me water. You're bringing me soda. Why are you doing that? Like most people have an issue because they're either the other person is either going to take offense to it or the person who says it think you're going to take offense to it. Either one of the ways, that's what prevents people from having those really, really simple but can be tough conversations, right? And that's because that's what I feel most of the time that comes, I feel like that comes from either negative past experiences in other relationships or whether that be friendships or romantically, or it comes from home where you ask for something and you're told, no, you're a child. That's, you're not supposed to do that. Like you're not supposed to have a comment or I felt like bringing you juice. That's what the fuck you're going to take. As opposed to being a child that can say, but mom, I want water. Juice is not good for my development. I don't give a fuck. You know, shit like that. So I think, like, in essence, that's kind of what I think causes that direction of people saying, you know, I'm going to just take this juice and I'm not going to say anything. And then they're going to keep taking the juice and keep taking the juice. And then most people only know how to respond in anger, too. So, therefore, I'm going to keep taking the juice until I get absolutely angry. And then I'm going to blow like a, like, like a whale. And that's usually where the discord, in my opinion, is one of them two things. Either you think they're going to yeah. do it or they're actually going to do it. So, and it's not easy. A big part is like effective communication. Because a lot of people talk about communication, but they don't. I don't think many people realize that it's not enough to just say a thing. It's not enough to just communicate a thing. You have, if you care about your relationships, you have to learn to communicate your boundaries, but also learn how to communicate in a way that a person can receive your message. Because if you only speak English, I don't know how to do that. and I'm telling you, like, my wants and needs in Spanish, yeah, I communicated it. But how you know what I'm talking about? Like, even with all my homies, my homies know I got a big lexicon. I love words. I use big words when I'm communicating with certain people. Like, the way that I speak shifts. And the words that I use shift based on that person and based on how they receive information. That's not to say that I don't think my niggas can understand what I'm saying. It's more so what is the most efficient way for my message to get to you. So then we can work together and making sure that our wants and needs are being met. And most people aren't that thoughtful because we're taught from an early age that like our thoughts don't matter. Our feelings don't matter. Just like you said with, with your examples, like that's just reaffirming for a child. Oh, my wants don't matter. My needs don't matter. My, my perception on my life or what I want for myself doesn't matter. Because when you were a child, especially mm -hmm. if you grew up like how I grew up, it was always speak when spoken to, do as I do, not as, I mean, do as I say, not as I do. It was always stay out of place. And all Back. those things are just different codes for you are not, you are not an equal or equitable human being. You are a thing to be controlled and you are a thing to be governed over. You don't have a say in your own identity or how you show up. And then we internalize oh that my shit. God. We internalize yes, that shit God. and then we grow up and we don't we don't meet those things. We don't work through those or we don't have the resources to do that effectively and then we just regurgitate that on onto everybody else. Boom. That's it. That's it. I feel like that is an amazing place for me to <laughs> wrap because there are no more words to be said after that because that is exactly what happens to most of us. And especially if you, in my opinion, I know there's no one size fit all plan, but I feel like for 90% of us, if you grew up as a little black kid, that is practically how your child. That was me all day, son. Me all day. I mean, 
you don't have no place here. You do what I tell you to do. You, you speak when I tell you to speak. Don't be in grown folks business. You don't have no opinions. You going to eat this food. Let me, let me tell you one that I learned. I thought I was going to wrap up right here, but then it just sparked the thought because some of the things, some of the, some of the things that I've been like learning about myself um, in therapy is, it's been translating into other areas of my life. Something I learned that I'm really desperately trying to break out of right now is as a kid being told I have to finish mm, my entire plate. Even when I was full, having to finish my plate. And then now I'm an adult who's desperately trying to live a very long yeah. fucking life because I got kids to raise and grandkids to raise, okay? So, like, feeling like learning, unlearning those habits of, like, if I go somewhere and I buy something and I don't want all of it, I can save it for later. I don't have to eat it all right now. It's something called a refrigerator that was invented. I yeah. can put it in there. Like, like rewiring my mind, like telling myself I don't have to finish this entire plate if, I, if I'm full. Like, shit like that. It's like, shit you internalize that you don't even fucking know you internalize. Ain't it? Therapy's a wonderful thing, and I just suggest like, you all. I, 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 there's a caveat <laughs> there, though, because, like, <laughs> we all don't have equitable access to therapy and there i'm sure it's not most people but there are some people to where like talk therapy which is the therapy that i'm sure that you and i are mostly referring to is not for everybody but there's so many different forms of therapy and there's so many therapeutic things that you can do for your life outside of just the different forms of therapy that exist within the system um but I, I encourage everybody, if you have the resources, definitely do it. I mean, I've been I've been in and out of therapy since I was 18. Like, my mom's kicked me out at 18, and I had nowhere to go. And I was like, yeah, nigga, you need help. You need help. And niggas can say what they want, but Obamacare came through for me, Slim. Because if it wasn't for that, I don't even know where I would be or what I would be doing. Because um, that was how I was able to go go to therapy. Same here. Same here. Same here. You know what? I'm going to plug something. They ain't pay for this, but I'm glad you said that. Um, I also learned talking to some of my friends, especially my entrepreneur friends out there. I've learned that a lot of you all don't know about resources that exist. So if you go to healthcare.gov, it is an amazing website. It will it, it will help to see if you qualify for funds that can help you pay for health insurance, even if you are self-employed, even if you don't have a oh, job, that's lit. period. They will help. Please do it. Because like he said, some of it, some of us just don't yeah. have the resources, period. But some of us have them. We just don't know they're available. Yeah. So yeah. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Go to that website. It'll hey, change your life. Big up to you for that. Um, that, that I appreciate you for that. Yeah, man. Because, I, I mean, when you said it, it sparked a thought. Because a lot of... I have four entrepreneur friends that had no idea they could have health insurance. And I was talking to them in November, and I was like, why I don't? Why you don't got no health insurance? And I was like, oh, because I'm self-employed. And I was like, yeah, me too. So you think I'm working right here with no insurance? What's wrong with you? No, yeah. go to this website. And he and he so happened one of them um uh, one of them happened to go get insurance and then ended up it's it's so it's life is very interesting in a way because one of them ended up getting um insurance of uh two years ago actually and then twenty twenty one ended up breaking her hand and that insurance paid for what would have been a two hundred thousand yeah. dollar surgery. So 
in my mind, that was the moment I was like, wait, the information that I know is way more impactful than I ever realized. Because I call myself, I am the king of random information. Like I know a lot of random things in my head and I, I'm trying to break myself out of thinking these are random thoughts. This shit could help somebody life, but I'm just throwing it in my head because in my mind, it's random useless facts. Nobody wants to fucking hear, but I'm going to find a way to I'm monetize that. I'm, I'm working on that this year. I'm working on a way to monetize my random facts this year. I'm, <laughs> I'm working on it, y'all. But this is going to be a great place to wrap up. So, Adam, I want you to tell the people all the socials you want to oh, be found me. on. So that if the people want to follow, right, they so, can. Um, you can find me on IG at yen.wave, which we didn't even get into that piece, but we will... No, because I said that I wanted to know what the name was. Okay, for a bonus question, what is the um, meaning of the name? So, my artist name is Yin. Um, most people know Yin okay. as the Japanese currency, but the actual definition of Yin is to have a deep desire or propensity for something. And that's how I feel about music, because music is the thing that has gotten me to where I'm at. Um, and waveform is what the music makes. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, on Twitter it's Mister Adamantin twelve. Um, so that's M R A D A M A N T I N E twelve. And then on TikTok it's just Mister Adamantin without the twelve. Um, and am I missing one? No, I think that's it because I just got like IG. Twitter and I just made this TikTok. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's everything. Um, you know, I got my on all my socials. I got my uh, I got my little link tree situation. So you, you know, it'll link you to everything. Um, you know, if you perfect, so the people can find them. Yeah, I, you do put out in the world. I got, they can. So I'm working on my first. I'm working on my debut project right now. It's it's still in the like middle stages, but. What I did was on SoundCloud because I'm a, I'm a very community driven nigga. So what I did on SoundCloud was I published instrumentals that I created, and um, so people can like just hear what I'm coming up with. And as I work on the project and start like recording demos of the songs, I'm going to be updating the playlist so that people can hear it in real time as I am working on it. And then when it's finally able to release, I'm going to release it on all um streaming platforms. But you know. Perfect. So y'all go out and support my friend Adam. He is, as you can hear from this interview, a very I'm intelligent flattered. human being. He uses a lot of two dollar <laughs> words like propensity. I was quoting. I was quoting <laughs> the actual <laughs> definition. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and um, support him. I think he's next up i just need the i need the powers that be to tap well, tap tap in like sweetie said and um i'm a man of action i don't speak scene. on i'm gonna leave it at that <laughs> so, that's fair enough when they see you on billboards gang, gang. they gonna know when they see you in their favorite campaigns they gonna know um but y'all like i said y'all go out and support adam and thank you all for listening to my show, the XL Tribesman Podcast. And until next time, peace the fuck out. I need to come up with a tagline.